were fundamentally changing the medical assistance in dying uh, regime uh, with very little input on a matter that is literally about life and death. It, it, the, the approach that the government has taken is, is frankly reckless and it is dangerous. A literal matter of life and death is currently being rushed through Parliament right now. So why is the mainstream media not informing the people about it? Trey Humphrey here with Rebel News, and in a previous report found at rebelnews.com, I interviewed the president of the Delta Hospice Society, Angelina Ireland, who refers to the immense pressures the small hospice has been receiving ever since refusing to offer medical assistance and dying made as stone-cold communism. We were given a 35-year lease from the Fraser Health Authority in order to build uh, these buildings on that land. And now they want to cancel that lease and they want to steal our buildings. Um, so, you know, we're in a position where, um, you know, I characterize it as just being stone cold communism. Mm -hmm. Well, that ordeal originally started shortly after Bill C-14 was passed, making Canada one of the few places in the world where euthanasia is formally legalized. Now, CBC reported that Justin Trudeau defended the government's controversial legislation on doctor-assisted dying as a responsible first step. And boy, he wasn't kidding when he implied that the liberals were just getting started when it comes to medically-assisted deaths. In fact, right now, just four years after Bill C-14 was passed, the liberals are swiftly rushing through another controversial act to amend the criminal code regarding MAID called Bill C-7. Now, while those in favor of the bill argue that those with disabilities deserve to have the option of made, the opposition brings up many concerns surrounding the sanctity of life, including that if Bill C-7 is passed, it would broaden eligibility for medical assistance in dying by repealing the eligibility requirement that the person's natural death has become reasonably foreseeable. Now, as the window of opportunity is closing for the Liberals to simply slow down their quest to rush the passing of such an impactful bill, some MPs like Cloverdale Langley's Tamara Jansen and St. Albert Edmonton's Michael Cooper have been giving it all they've got to be a voice of reason on this matter. Now, I sat down to interview Cooper to help bring you a better understanding of the controversial bill that is simply not getting the media coverage that a bill this substantial deserves. Here's what Michael had to say. All right. So we have Michael Cooper here today. Thank you so much for being here on Rebel News. Now, when it comes to medical assisted dying, you are very, very experienced on the matter. I know you served in a committee with the physicians um, who had to deal with that, I guess, in last parliament. And why don't you just tell us a little bit about how you've been involved in um, in this? Sure. Well, I have been involved in this issue since I was elected uh, in 2015. Immediately after the election, uh, then interim conservative leader Rana Ambrose appointed me as the vice chair of the special joint committee on physician assisted dying. That committee was tasked with reviewing the Supreme Court Carter decision. Mm -hmm. uh, that decision struck down the blanket criminal code prohibition on physician assisted dying and uh, looked at the decision, looked at a range of issues, and uh, put recommendations forward to the government on a legislative response to that decision. And then I uh, sat on the Justice Committee uh, during the uh, study of Bill C-14, uh, which was the government's legislative response to Carter, and as it currently stands, that is the uh, medical assistance in dying framework in Canada up until the bill that we're now uh, uh, debating, which is Bill C-7. Right, so you, can you tell us a little bit about what is new for those who haven't had a chance to follow Bill C-7? What is the main difference? What is the main concern with it? There are a lot of concerns. Uh, first of all, Bill C-7 is a purported response to the Quebec Superior Court decision of Truchon. 
In Prushan, the Quebec court struck down the requirement that death be reasonably foreseeable uh, in order to qualify for medical assistance in dying. So that decision uh, found that an, an end of life context to be unconstitutional. Uh, we believed in the official opposition at the time that the government should have appealed the decision that the attorney general should have brought that matter up for appeal and have taken it, if necessary, all the way to the Supreme Court. After all, uh, it is a fundamental change uh, in terms of what Parliament had passed uh, a mere four and a half uh, years uh, ago. Uh, the Attorney General uh, didn't do that. Uh, the Attorney General uh, decided against appealing and, and then introduced legislation, uh, Bill C-7. But uh, not only did the legislation uh, respond to the Trushan decision, it went well beyond the parameters of Trushan. And so what is in the bill uh, is the removal of other important safeguards uh, that were passed as part of Bill C-14. Uh, what kind of safeguards? Uh, well, uh, everything from a 10-day reflection period to ensure that someone who makes that major uh, decision has some time uh, to reflect on it before it is carried out. Uh, under Bill C-7, uh, it is possible that there could be same-day death, that someone could make a request and the procedure could be carried out with any reflection. Uh, additionally, uh, the bill removes the requirement that there be two independent witnesses. Uh, when one executes a will, uh, it's required that there be two witnesses to validate that will. Uh, surely, uh, one would expect at, at the very least, uh, as, as, uh, not a lesser safeguard when we're talking about medical assistance in dying, but that's precisely what Bill C-7 would do in as much as it would provide that there only be one witness. And uh, the other thing that Bill C-7 does is it removes the requirement that there be an independent witness, two independent witnesses. So now you have a situation where someone who's attending to a person's care uh, could be a witness. That creates issues around uh, power imbalance, uh, conflict of interest, uh, especially having regard for persons who are, are vulnerable in their most vulnerable state. And uh, in terms of the reasonably foreseeable aspect being removed, uh, what is concerning there is that literally now anyone who uh, is suffering from a degenerative disability uh, could qualify. And that has raised enormous concerns within the disabilities rights community, uh, which is why uh, when the Trushan decision was rendered, uh, 72 organizations uh, representing uh, persons with disabilities right across Canada uh, penned a letter calling on Attorney General David Lametti to appeal the decision because in the view of those organizations, uh, vulnerable persons, persons with disabilities uh, could be dehumanized and their lives could be put at risk. Uh, that the message would be sent that having, that living a life with a disability uh, is, is worse than in fact uh, dying. And uh, so uh, they called on the minister to appeal the decision. Uh, that plea fell on deaf ears. Mm -hmm. And you would think appealing it would at the very least have allowed more time. I believe Canada is one of the few places in the world where there is something like made medical assistance in dying, and it's only been around a few years. Now, we also have the pandemic going on, and that adds complications to things, especially for vulnerable people who are, you know, in care homes. We saw that there was recently an elderly woman who, when faced or being faced with um, some more isolation time, she opted out. So why is it that Bill C-7, with all of this stuff going on and with it being so vital to the sanctity of life, why does it seem to be so rushed? Well, because the government has taken the approach that they know best. Uh, they, uh, the Attorney General, uh, had uh, consultations that were online with a predetermined outcome prior to the introduction of Bill C-7 that ignored uh, 
of communities that are remote and rural, persons with cognitive or mobility impairments who wouldn't easily be able to pr provide input by a, on, online. Uh, and um, they have proceeded to rush this through. And uh, what it has meant is that we're fundamentally changing the medical assistance in dying uh, regime uh, with very little input on a matter that is literally about life and death. It, it, the, the approach that the government has taken is, is frankly reckless and it is dangerous. And it's why uh, not only have 72 uh, disabilities rights organizations penned a letter to the minister, more than a thousand physicians have expressed their opposition not to mention the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, who has expressed concern about whether Canada is meeting its international obligations on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So lots of opposition, but the government has literally ignored those concerns. So where is everything at right now? What have you been up to with trying to communicate these concerns for this bill? We have put forward at the Justice Committee where the bill uh, was being studied uh, a number of amendments to maintain what we think are reasonable safeguards, like the 10-day reflection period, like requiring two independent witnesses, like uh, requiring a longer reflection period where death uh, is not reasonably foreseeable, and uh, a, a, a common sense amendment to say that it should be patient initiated. In other words, that no physician should introduce this mm -hmm. to a patient, uh, having regard for concerns around uh, coercion, even if unintended. Uh, unfortunately, the Liberals ignored all of our amendments, defeating them, uh, despite the fact that uh, the disabilities rights community, uh, many, many physicians and other key st stakeholders expressed strong support for very modest and reasonable amendments that we put forward. Wow. Now, I did a report on a hospice over here where I am. I'm in BC. It was the Delta, or it is called the Delta Hospice, and they had quite the battle. I believe they only had 10 beds and uh, they refused to offer maid medical assistant and dying and that the battle the legal battle the financial battle that they've had to do to take that stance um it's it's kind of a david and goliath type fight so if this bill passes what would be the next step for people like that hospice who you know this is just not something that they're willing to do well, we've also uh, called on the government and we brought forward a, a, an amendment around conscience rights uh, to protect uh, medical practitioners from being forced in any way to participate uh, in, this, uh, in this procedure uh, on the basis of uh, freedom of religion and freedom of conscience. Uh, and that was uh, also rejected by the government. Uh, they conveniently ruled that uh, it was uh, out of order, our amendment. Uh, but um, it is a, a real concern around conscience rights. And in terms of, you, you mentioned uh, about hospices, I mean, there is a, an essential need for palliative care. Right. When, when Bill uh, C-14 was introduced, around 30% of Canadians had access to palliative care. Today, uh, four and a half, five years later, 30% of Canadians have access to palliative care. Wow. And when we're talking about physician-assisted death, now that it is legalized, uh, palliative care is an absolutely essential service. Uh, otherwise, uh, a patient is not able to make a truly autonomous choice. How can you make such a choice if the only choice is to suffer intolerably or carry out medical uh, assistance in dying? People need the option of having a lived experience. Well, I got to tell you, after doing that report, I had a lot of emails from concerned, concerned citizens who believed that they lost a loved one 
due to pressure uh, for made that it wasn't their loved one's choice and they wouldn't have cho- chosen it on themselves had it not been brought to their attention in the way it was. So thank you so much, uh, Michael, for doing what you're doing in the government and being a voice. And we'll be following this closely. Now, if someone wants to get involved in anything, is there somewhere they can go to online or to just be more involved in what's happening with Bill C-7? Well, I, I think uh, at this point it is going to the Senate, so uh, there's an opportunity to uh, express uh, their views, to bring submissions to the Senate committee. Uh, that that uh, deadline has not passed, so there is an opportunity for public input. Okay. Well, thank you so much, and thanks for being on Rebel News today. Thank you. As you can see from the lack of media coverage regarding Bill C-7, we at Rebel News bring you the other side of the story. Now, if you appreciate that, please head to rebelnews.com just in case the censorship of truth bug removes us from this platform. That's how you can keep in touch with us. Now, also while you're there, why not knock off some Christmas gifts from your shopping list and hit up our new store, buy some really cool swag for people like you and I, and use my coupon DREA10. That helps support us, and we appreciate any support you have for us.